Apprentices, is that what we're called, doing an apprenticeship? <laughs> the bosses are away, so those on apprenticeship are up here. I hope we're not too painful. <laughs> um, Pastor Matt and Pastor Janine and the boys are in Queensland. They'll be away two Sundays. So could we just take a moment and pray a highway church blessing over them? So, Father, we thank you for our leaders, Pastor Matt and Pastor Janine. We thank you for those three precious boys, Lord. And Father, we ask that this break in Queensland will be refreshing. Father God, that your blessing will be upon them, Lord, in all they do. That, Lord, they will have the most amazing time, not only with each other, but, Lord God, with you. My Lord, keep them safe. Invigorate them, Lord. Raise them up strong and refresh them in your precious name. Amen. As a church, we have, um, uh, last week we started praying for 40 days um, for Australia, for the borders. The disunity that's come between states is very sad, isn't it? The comments you see made from Victoria towards South Australia, and it's all understandable because there's a lot of tension. But we're praying for the borders that God will raise up um, a spiritual barrier that will stop COVID from entering from state to state. We're asking and praying that God will bring back unity to Australia, that we will be a nation once again of open borders and not a nation divided. 
We're also praying for our Prime Minister and the government. And I would encourage you in your quiet time to pray for, for, for this, for our nation, the great south land of the Holy Spirit, who is needing the watchman on the wall to stand and discern what is coming against our country. It's time that we ask Jesus to open our spiritual eyes that we can discern what it is we need to pray for. So I encourage you to do that, please. Australia needs us. Actually, Jesus needs us for Australia. He's seated on the right hand of the Father. He's doing His part. But we need to do ours. So I encourage us all, even five minutes, whatever you can give to Australia, I encourage you to do that. It's a powerful, powerful responsibility that we have. Um, also, um, homecoming is um, in two weeks' time. Anyone who is new to our church is invited to lunch in Kids Church. So if you are new here today and you haven't received an invitation, if you see Q or Jean, they will make sure you get this invitation. And now it's great delight to invite our preacher, Preacher Mike. But could I just share with you, he's not only Preacher Mike, Mike has been a pastor and led his own two churches for 10 years. And he's come here and he usually sits back there somewhere, no fuss, no bother. That, my friends, is a humble man who has been a pastor in his own churches for over 10 years and chooses to come and be one of us here. Pastor Mike, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Welcome to the pulpit. We're all pastors. God doesn't need to call us titles. He calls us by name. Uh, just a plug before I start. Um, as you heard Janine last week, um, I'm starting a men's connect group. So after the school holidays, Tuesday nights, every fortnight, starting at 7.30 at my place. So you've got a couple of weeks notice. Those men, sorry ladies, not, you're not invited this time. Um, we'll uh, meet together. I've got a couple of people already who have said they would like to join us. So uh, you're welcome to come. Okay. I've got a topic today and it really ties in with what we've already been doing. God always does that, doesn't he? But um, it's something that we all need. It's something that picks us up, spurs us on, gives us a foundation. What is that that we all need? And it's something that our nation and our world needs at this moment. It's encouragement. Encouragement. The gift of encouragement is such a powerful thing. And um, I was just listening to the news last night and they're talking about mental health issues amongst our young people. Our young people, because of the climate of fear that is in our nation and in our world, young people are struggling. And so we need to, to give them encouragement. Not all encouragement is good. There are forms of encouragement that are not so good. I'll just give you a couple or three examples. If you... Read the book of Proverbs, um, chapter 27 and verse 14 as an example of encouragement in the wrong context. He who blesses his friend with a loud voice early in the morning, it will be reckoned a curse to him. I'll just do a, a little poll. How many of you would consider yourself to be a night owl? You love the, the nights, but you struggle to get up in the mornings. Not so many night owls. Come on. How many night owls do we have? I'm not a night owl, so I can't comment. 
How many of you would call yourself an early bird? You like to get up early and you do your most of your tasks early in the morning. Well, you, there's a lot of people who aren't either or. <laughs> Night owls definitely don't want an early greeting. Early birds, less of a problem, but for me, I, I prefer to spend my first thing in the morning with the Lord, and so I'm not really encouraging people to bless me first thing in the morning. <laughs> Another one, Isaiah 41, verse 7. And this is uh, not all encouragement is according to God's purpose. In verse 7 of Isaiah 41, it says, So the craftsman encourages the smelter, and he who smooths metal with a hammer encourages him who beats the anvil, saying of the soldering, it is good. And he fastens it with nails so that it will not totter. It will not fall over. What they're talking about is the making of idols. And so one part, one craftsman says to the other, it's good, you're doing well. But in the end, they're all of them going against the purposes of God. So encouragement that is not in line with the purpose of God is not good encouragement. It is valueless. It doesn't work. And the third one is the book of James. In the book of James, chapter 2, James talks about faith and actions. And in verse 15, he says, If a brother or sister is without clothing, and in need of daily food. And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled. And yet you did not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Faith without actions. All those good words about go away, be filled, be encouraged. It means nothing. If that person's need is something practical, like having something to eat or having some warmth and some clothes. So not all encouragement is good. We need to, to have encouragement that blesses and lifts us up. We all love encouragement. You can see the way young people just thrive on, on encouragement. We all need encouragement. But the thing I want to talk about this morning is that God doesn't want us to be so much receivers of encouragement. He wants us to be givers of encouragement. Like everything that God gives us, it's for passing on. God encourages us that we can encourage others. He wants us to pass that on. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And the more you give it away, the more God's going to give it back to you. You need to be an encourager. God wants us all to be an encourager. We live in the end times. If you turn over to Hebrews chapter 10, this is a message for the end times. And these are two verses that you should all know. Hebrews 10 verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There were three things there that we're called to do. One is to stir up. Are you a good stirrer? We need stirrers. But stirrers for good. Stir up one another to do good things. And don't neglect meeting together. That's what we're doing this morning. We need encouragement. When we get together, isn't it good? I've loved the worship so far. It's good to be in the house of God. We need to do that. It builds us up. But the third element is we need to encourage one another. We need to encourage one another as we see the day drawing near. Janine recently gave us a... a, a uh, an example of the end times that we're in and the things that are happening around us. We can sit, read the signs of the times and they mean we need to encourage one another. Back in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, encourage one another day after day. 
As long as it's called today, encourage one another. It's a daily thing. Don't just wait and do it once in a while. Daily encourage those around you. God wants us to encourage each other. In Romans chapter 15, we have some good advice. Romans chapter 15 and verse 1. Paul tells us, verse 1 says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbour for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, as as is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Jesus Christ. God calls us to look, not out, look out for not only our own interests, but those around us, to be encouragers. And the God of all encouragement, he will use us. God can encourage people directly, but he chooses to use us to be his instruments to encourage those around us. So God wants to encourage us. Today, I want to focus on one person in the Bible who was an encourager. And to see out of one person how a world can be changed. If you turn to Acts chapter 4, we read about this person. I'll introduce you. His, his name is Joseph. Though you don't know him by that name. He's a Levite, which means he's from the, the priestly tribe, the tribe in Israel that were priests. His birthplace was Cyprus. But uh, you probably don't recognise him from that explanation. <laughs> Acts chapter 4 and verse 36. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement. Barnabas, we all know him by the word Barnabas. He's a man that uh, comes up in the book of Acts. And uh, he, he, through a few chapters, we, we, we read of things that happened in his life. But I also want to say that um, names are very important. God calls people by name. God knows you and me by our name, the name that our parents gave us. Sometimes that name we feel maybe is not entirely appropriate and sometimes we use our middle name, sometimes we use a nickname. But God calls us by name. He knows us individually by name. But do you know that God has another name for us sometimes or all the time? In Revelation chapter 2, uh, and verse 17, it talks about one of the churches that those who overcome will receive a white stone. And on that white stone will be a new name, a name that only they and God will know. Isn't that amazing that God has a new name for each one of us who overcomes? And it's a name that represents our character, just like Barnabas son of encouragement. In many areas of Barnabas's life, he portrayed that encouragement. And so the apostles decided, let's not call him Joseph, let's call him Barnabas. And we know that Jesus, he saw Simon and he said to Simon, nah, you're not Simon, you're Peter. We know him as Peter. And we know of a man called Saul that wasn't happy with the name Saul, and he became Paul, apostle to the Gentiles. God has got a name for us. God wants us to, to know that we're special and that we have a purpose. 
And that name represents our character and who we are and what God wants to do in our lives. So Barnabas, son of encouragement. And we can see, and I've got five things, hopefully they're not long, five things that I want to say that show that encouragement in action. And the first one is in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9 and verses 26 and 27, And here we have Saul, this guy that was going around persecuting the church. And then he has this life-transforming experience of meeting Jesus. And he's a changed man. And he starts preaching and they're out to kill him and so he has to leave Damascus and he goes back to Jerusalem. And he wants to meet the leaders of the church. He's now a Christian and wanting to go on for the Lord. But verse 26, when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. They were all afraid of this guy, Saul. Could he be just trying to infiltrate the church and find out who was the important people so he could cart them off? But Barnabas, son of encouragement, didn't just take things at surface level. Do you read, do you, do you look at a book and judge it by the cover? Do you look at a person and judge them by their appearance? Barnabas went further, he dug deeper. He took the risk of getting alongside this guy, Saul, and asking him some deep questions. He knew when he took him to the the apostles who this Saul was, the change that that had occurred in his life. And he was prepared to stand up for him and say, he's with me, he's okay. That's what encouragement does. Encouragement doesn't look at the surface, it looks deeper. It doesn't look at the problems that there may have been in the past. It says, this man has integrity. This person is worth the risk. That's what encouragement does. The second thing, Acts chapter 11 and verse 19. And here we have the church after the persecution that occurred when Stephen was martyred. The church was persecuted and the Christians in Jerusalem had to spread out. And they went to various regions, and one of those regions was Antioch. Verse 19, I'm going to read from verse 19 to verse 26. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, an amazing story where the church spreads and something new happens. They reach a different culture, a different nationality. The Greek people, instead of the Jewish people, they become uh, Christians. They follow Christ. And so the the church, the head office, the head church in Jerusalem hears about this and they say, hey, something new's happened. We better 
we're going to check out what's happened and make sure it's okay. They choose Barnabas and send him off to Antioch to, to see what's happening and to sort it out. It's like the church in Adelaide, if we were a new church, sending a, a delegation to border town. What are these guys doing? Are they okay? The amazing thing is that Barnabas sees what's happening. It's all new. It's all different. Greeks don't worship the same as, as, as uh, Jews. Their customs are so different. But what Barnabas sees is the grace of God. Encouragement sees the grace of God. It may be new, it may be different, but it's still the hand of God. God is doing things, and we need to, as God's people, see that. That's what encouragement does. It doesn't sort of say, oh, no, we better stop this. We better get back to doing things the Jewish way. Let's allow God freedom to do what he wants to do. So he sees God's hand, even though it's different, and encourages that's the second thing. The first thing was that uh, he's willing to, to see beyond the superficial. Encouragement sees the hand of God and the different. The third thing that God, uh, that encouragement does is it sees the potential in others. In verse 25, Barnabas is there, the church is going well, but he sees something's lacking. He sees that there's room for some growth in the body, he knows there's a young man named Saul who's got tremendous potential. And he sees this as an opportunity to, to bring him in to that, to that place and see him grow and the church grow, both grow together. And so he actually leaves the church, goes to Tarsus where Paul is from and where he's returned since going to Jerusalem. And he says to Saul, I want you to come and join me and to be part of this work. I know there is a gift of God in you that needs to be released. That's what an encourager does. It calls out the gifting. We need to call out the gifting on those around us, especially the young people in our midst. They have giftings and callings that need to be called out. I was amazed, not amazed, I was encouraged a couple of weeks ago when uh, Michaela, we sent her off. And Barb came up and said, I remember when I prophesied over you when you were born. Was that right? Yeah. When you were born, I prophesied that you were going to be an evangelist and go and uh, be effective. That's what the church needs, calling out those giftings. And so Barnabas calls Saul into the church. And it says that they ministered there the whole year. A whole year they were there together, Barnabas and Saul. Saul would have been developing in his giftings and, and, and Barnabas would have been mentoring and encouraging him. But the other thing is that um, their gift of encouragement goes beyond that to seeing your protege actually do better than yourself. In the, in the next chapter, they go off on their first missionary journey and uh, they, they, they go to Cyprus to start with and then they go to the mainland. And when they reach the mainland, it's called Paul and his companions. Barnabas is totally left out of the picture. He's just one of Paul's companions. At that stage, Saul has become Paul. Okay, so the third thing is that releases others, mentors and calls out that gifting. The fourth one, Acts 13 and one to five. Verse one, now there were Antioch in the church there, that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Oh, I'll read verse 5 as well. When they reached Salamis, 
They began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. So the fourth example of encouragement that Barnabas brings is that he allows the Holy Spirit to move. We need to allow the Holy Spirit freedom. As a church leader, as anyone in leadership, we need to give space to the Holy Spirit. And that's what Barnabas does. He gives space to the Holy Spirit. They're just in a prayer meeting, and we've had a couple of prayer meetings in the last little while because of uh, this COVID crisis, and we've given God space. We've allowed the Holy Spirit to speak through individuals and to to bring words that will give us direction and, and guidance. And that's what Barnabas did. As the church uh, senior pastor, he could have said, no, no, we'll do things my way. But he said, no, let's wait on the Lord. Let's see what the Lord wants to say. And what the Holy Spirit said was, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the purpose that I have for them, which is not here, which is to go and to share the gospel. Just imagine, we have a prayer meeting and the Holy Spirit says, send pastors Matt and Janine and Barb off. They've got a a task that I want them to do over the other side of the world. That's a fairly big thing. But Barnabas was quite happy with God setting them apart and doing that. And it happened immediately. They didn't wait around and say, oh, we'll do it next year or the year after. If God says do it, we just respond and do it. And that's what they did. So the fourth thing is that we need to allow the Holy Spirit to move. Encouragement, the spirit of encouragement, allows the Holy Spirit to do things that may be unexpected. But it's in the going. It's like Peter was saying, that the journey sometimes has twists and turns that we're not aware of, but those are part of the journey. The fifth thing is that the the Holy Spirit wants us to see past people's mistakes. Sometimes we limit God's plans by by past mistakes. We read in verse 5 of chapter 13 that they took along John Mark to help them. John Mark, this young guy. Paul himself wasn't that much older, but they take John Mark as well. But unfortunately, things don't work out. When they go from Cyprus over to the mainland, John Mark decides that he'll leave them and go back home. He was originally from Jerusalem. He's actually um, Barnabas's cousin. His mother is Mary, and it was at Mary's house that the early church met in prayer when Peter was in prison. And the angel uh, unlocked Peter from the, the cells and, and got him out, and Peter thought it was all a dream till he got outside. <laughs> And then he went back to the the prayer meeting at Mary's place. And John Mark was there. And Barnabas had brought him to Antioch. And on the first missionary journey, they decided to take John Mark with them as an apprentice. Barb was talking about apprentices this morning. He went along, but something didn't go well with him, and he decided to return home. And I want you to turn over now to uh, uh, Acts 15. Oh, sorry, 16. Acts 16. Oh, sorry, back to 15. It is 15, the end of 15. They've come back from their first missionary journey. They've they've gone to the Council of Jerusalem to to sort out the problem about circumcision and and these Jewish laws that uh, the uh, Greek Christians shouldn't have to, to follow. And so... Barnabas and Saul want to go on another Christian uh, outreach. Verse 36, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. 
and there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. So they both went in different directions, Barnabas and Paul. But there was a sharp disagreement. Barnabas said, let's give John, Mark, another chance. Let's give him a second try. Paul said, nah. Paul was a young man. He was still growing in his ministry. And he just didn't want to have any compromise. And that's part of youth. No compromise. As you get older, as you get to my age, you see that um, principles are good. We need to be strong on principles. But we need to be soft on people. We're human. We make mistakes. The Holy Spirit, though, gives us encouragement, gives us the ability to see people's potential beyond their mistakes. John Mark obviously made a mistake. He, he deserted. Barnabas was willing to give him another chance. Paul was not. We know that Paul went on to be a great father of the faith. He had many that looked to him as, his ment- as their mentor. And we know Timothy is one. Saw, Paul saw the potential in Timothy. And he had to encourage him over and over again. Timothy wasn't a bold man of faith like Paul was. He needed the encouragement. And there are many of us who are similar to Timothy. We need the encouragement. Barnabas was willing to give John Mark further encouragement. So he, he took him under his wing and encouraged him. The, the thing being that John Mark went on to do some incredible things. If you look at uh, Philemon chapter 24, Philemon, the little book before Hebrews, Paul, writing to Philemon, mentions Mark as a fellow worker, someone who was encouraged and had encouraged him. In verse 21, 24, it says, um, As do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. Mark actually got alongside Paul and helped him when he was in prison. He was able to communicate what Paul wanted to the churches. And uh, it goes even further that uh, in 2 Timothy, the last book that Paul wrote in this life, he also refers to Mark in uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 11. And he's writing, asking for, for different ones to visit him in prison. And he says in verse 11, Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. Paul came around and saw the potential that Mark had, but only after Barnabas had followed through with him. Mark wasn't only useful to Paul, he was also useful to Peter. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, Paul, uh, Peter, sorry, refers to Mark as like a son. And 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, he sends greetings. She who was in Babylon, which is another word for Rome, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, as does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you, all who are in Christ. Mark actually became like a son to Peter. Peter the apostle. And you know the gospel of Mark was written by the same young man, John Mark. He got alongside Peter. And the gospel of Mark is Peter's account of uh, Jesus' life. But it was written by John Mark. This man that Paul initially wrote off became quite an influence in the church. God wants to use us to encourage each other. He wants to use us to encourage the people around us. The world needs sons of encouragement, Barnabases. Do you know the last two verses of the Old Testament? Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 
talk about God raising up or sending Elijah before the the great and terrible day of the Lord, before his second coming, he's going to send an Elijah. Do you know that Elijah is us? It's a prophetic army. It's men and women who will be encouragers. But it says in the last verse that he will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the hearts of the children back to their, their parents. It's talking about parents, not just fathers, mothers and fathers. God is bringing mentors and disciples together. He's wanting to raise up people who will take others under their wing and encourage them and build them up and release them in their giftings and callings because God has chosen each of us for a purpose. He wants to use us to mentor and encourage those around us. Parents, your children are those first people that you need to encourage and build up. But we're all parents in the body of Christ. Parents or foster parents or guardians or grandparents. We need to call out those giftings and encourage each other.